Hi everyone, we meet again in another new video of learning business. In this video, we are going to be presenting a set of sample MCQ questions that could ideally appear in your CDCS exams or IBSL exams and we will discuss the answers in detail. So now let's get into the video. So here, first question. A documentary credit for US dollars 120,000 calls for shipment of fertilizer in February, March, April and May. So for four months. So ideally per month around 30,000 US dollars. Each shipment is to be for about about 500 tons. So remember article 30 what they mentioned regarding the word or the usage of the word about before the quantity of units or the quantity. So remember that the 10% more or less tolerance. Shipment was effected as follows. 450 tons sent 24th February for value of 27,000, 550 tons sent 12th April for value dollar 33,000, 460 tons sent 30th April for value US dollar 28,000, 550 tons sent 4th June for value US dollar 33,000. Which of the above shipments? will be honored on presentation. So here you have 120,000 of a LC, ideally spanning across four months. So or 30,000 worth uh, US dollars. So they have said about 500 tons, which means you ha should have your unit price around $60. Now here the use of the word about has been used in terms of quantity. So this use of word about lets you to have a plus or minus 10% tolerance. And this 10% tolerance is only available either for the amount of the LC, unit price or to the quantity for which the word about has been used before it. So here the word about has been used for quantity. So this 10% more or less tolerance applies for quantity only. So the unit price ideally cannot change. So here if you take the very first shipment, 450 tons. They say about 500 tons. So about 500 tons meaning plus or minus 10% which means 450 tons to 550 tons is available to be shipped. Within this tolerance range they will accept. So in between this, of course, 450 tons come in and it is sent on 24th February for the value of 27,000. So 450 is correct within the given tolerance band. It has been shipped during February and the unit price of 60 is constant. 60 multiplied by 450 is 27,000 US dollar. So first shipment can be honored as a complying presentation. Moving on to the second one. 550 tons sent 12th April for value of dollar 33,000. Now here 550 is again within the tolerance band. So acceptable. But can you see there has not been a shipment during the month of March. Now this particular month, this particular installment has not gone through. What does article 
32 tell us about? Remember article 32 of UCP 600? It says, if a drawing or shipment by installments within given period is stipulated in the credit and any installment is not drawn or shipped within the period allowed for the installment, the credit ceases to be available for that and any subsequent installment. So here what happens? Since you have not made the shipment for the month of March, the shipment installment for the month of March and the subsequent shipment will cease to exist, will not be available. So, typically, only the very first shipment can be accepted. All the other three, you don't even have to check on the quantity, check on the value. Since a subsequent installment has not gone through, Sorry, others cannot be accepted. So here, what is the valid shipment that can be honoured on presentation? The correct answer is answer A, number 1 only. In accordance with ISP 98, which of the following statements is correct? The issuer of a standby letter of credit must. The four options are validate the breach of any underlying transaction, ensure the accuracy of any documents presented, Ensure the genuineness of any documents presented. Honor presentation that appear on their face to comply. So, of course, it's a very straightforward question. Here, the correct answer is answer D. The issuer of the standby letter of credit must honor the presentation that appears to be a complying presentation on the face of it. They are not responsible for the underlining transaction. They are not responsible to ensure accuracy of any documents presented or to ensure the genuineness as long as it complies on the face of those documents. Yes, the issuer can honor that complying presentation. Third one, an issuer of a standby credit subject to ISP 98 is responsible for accuracy of any document, act of omission by the nominated bank, observance of law as stated in the standby, performance of any underlying transaction. Again, very straightforward question. So here the correct answer is answer C. Observance of law as stated in the standby. Again, repeating the same thing. Issuer of the standby credit is not responsible for accuracy of any documents or for any act of omission by another bank involved in this process or not responsible for the performance of the underlining transaction. Fourth question, a reimbursing bank has received a valid claim. Now here the keyword meaning it's a valid claim under its reimbursement undertaking. So you don't have to think about ascertaining factors regarding whether the claim is actually valid or not. Question itself tells you it's valid and is instructed by the issuing bank not to honour this particular valid claim. In accordance with URR 525, the reimbursing bank should request the claiming bank 
to cancel the claim, instruct the claiming bank to contact the beneficiary, honor the claim and debit the issuing bank account's number, dishonor the claim as per the issuing bank's instruction. Again, very straightforward question here. The correct answer here is answer C. Since it's a valid claim, yes, they have to go ahead and honor the claim and debit the issuing bank's account even though the issuing bank has instructed not to honor the claim. Why? It is a valid claim presented under the reimbursement undertaking. Fifth question. An importer requires goods of a stipulated quality while the exporter requires certainty of payment. Which of the following would best meet all requirements? So you want an uh, importer, the buyer wants quality. So ideally a quality certificate to ascertain whether the goods that you are sending is of a standard quality. For exporter, what do they want? They want certainty of payment. That payment will go through as promised. Let's see the four options. Confirmed standby credit payable on demand calling for beneficiary's quality certificate. Now, confirmed standby credit. Yes, acceptable. But... Is a quality certificate issued by the beneficiary itself is enough to satisfy the importer? Sorry, no. Moving on to second option. Confirmed documentary credit payable at sight. Again, that's also fine. Calling for beneficiary's quality certificate. Again, it is a quality certificate produced by the beneficiary themselves. It's like I'm making the goods and I'm the one giving the certificate saying, yes, it's of good quality. It's not valid enough. Moving on to the third. Confirm documentary credit available by acceptance with drafts drawn on confirming bank calling for third party quality certificate. Now here if you can read the answer or the choice, it is a confirmed letter of credit but it is available by acceptance where the draft is drawn on the confirming bank and the LC requires a third party quality certificate. So of course both parties, importer and exporter, will be happy. Importer will be happy, a quality certificate coming from third party, an independent party's assurance is provided. For the exporter, they are happy. Why? It is a LC which is confirmed by another confirming bank. Even though the payment is not at sight, not on demand, still... It is available by acceptance where the draft is drawn on the confirming bank. Let's see the last option. Unconfirmed documentary credit payable at sight with drafts on issuing bank calling for third party quality certificate. So here importer is happy but exporter is not so happy. It's it's an unconfirmed LC and requires the responsibility of the issuing bank itself. So when you check on all the options, what suits the best to meet all the requirements is answer C. Moving on to the next question, question number six. A German bank has added its confirmation to a letter of credit 
issued by a Turkish bank. Which of the following risks is not borne by the confirming bank? So the confirming bank is the German bank. An issuing bank is the Turkish bank. They are asking out of the risks given, what is the risk that the confirming bank is not responsible for? Fraud by beneficiary. If the beneficiary does any fraudulent activity, is the confirming bank responsible for it? Sorry, you can't hold the confirming bank liable for that. So, that is of course not a risk borne by the confirming bank. Insolvency of the issuing bank. If the Turkish bank which issued the documentary credit becomes insolvent, then the responsibility would of course lie in the hands of the confirming bank itself. So yes, that is a risk that they will take up. Refusal of the issuing bank to pay against complying documents. Again, yes, even this kind of a risk, the confirming bank will take up if the issuing bank declines to pay. If the issuing bank declines to pay. Final answer, government restrictions on fund transfer from issuing bank. So if there are any sudden instructions or restrictions which limit the ability of the issuing bank to make a fund transfer, then again at that time, that particular risk will have to be borne by the confirming bank. So here B, C, D are risks that are actually borne by the confirming bank, but A is not. So the question asks, what is the risk that is not borne by the confirming bank? So the correct answer is answer A. Which of the following can be combined under a credit available with and requiring a draft drawn on an issuing bank. Payment, deferred payment, acceptance and negotiation. Again, very straightforward question. Here they are asking what two options can be combined when there is a credit available with and requires a draft drawn on the issuing bank. So, of course, when a draft gets involved here, it is acceptance and payment. So, the correct answer is 1 and 3 only. So, the correct answer is B. Question number 8. In accordance with UCP 600, which of the following terms may not be altered on a transferred documentary credit? Again, very straightforward. What is not altered when it comes to a transferable letter of credit? Of course, when you transfer a letter of credit, you can adjust the amount you can adjust the period for presentation. You can also adjust the amount of insurance cover. What you can't ideally alter is the required documents mentioned in the credit. Now here in this question, please be vigilant. The question asks you, which of the following terms may not be altered? They are not asking what can be reduced or what can be increased. That can be a different question. But they are asking you what items can you not change at all? So here A, C and D which is amount, period for presentation, amount of insurance cover. You can change them. Meaning either you should be able to reduce it or either you should be able to increase it. 
but b the requirement the required documents sorry you cannot alter so here the correct answer is b question number 9 a cumulative revolving documentary credit is opened with 6 months validity and allowing for dollar 25000 to be drawn each month so per month 25000 and it's on cumulative revolving basis if only the first month shipment is effected in full which means 125000 has been effected in full what is the available amount in the fourth month so in the very first month the 25000 has been fulfilled second month sorry you haven't done anything third month you haven't done anything now you are here in the fourth month they asking you for the fourth month what is the available amount so even though you have not used the second and the third months allocation since it's cumulative you should be able to bring it forward for the fourth month so here in the fourth month you have a 25000 which belongs to the second month you have a 25000 which belongs to the third month and you have another 25000 which is applicable for the fourth month itself so here the correct answer is c us dollar 75000 question number 10 a documentary credit which allows partial shipments has the following shipment schedule you have 1000 units which can be shipped between 1st june to 30th june 2000 units which can be shipped between 1st july to 31st july 2000 units to be shipped between 1st august to 31st 3000 units to be shipped between 1st september to 30th september so this is the schedule that they have given in the documentary credit the beneficiary shipped the goods and presented the documents as follows so in the beneficiary's shipment schedule these are the details they have shipped 1000 units on 15 june and presented on the 30th june itself so looks like the very first one there is no issue in it second one 3000 units shipped on 15th july and presented on 28th july now period is of no concern it is within the stipulated period what what but what about the units they have not used any jargon in front which allows for any tolerance but still they have sent 1000 units extra so sorry doesn't look like it can be accepted then the third one 2000 units shipped on 31st july and presented on 15th august again the shipment is not done during the stipulated time period but what's worst of all is when you have not done a complying presentation if for the month of july the lc or the part partial shipment or the drawing cease to exist for the month of july and for any subsequent period so of course the july period august and september all three would ideally be now getting cancel let's see the question which of the above sets of documents are complying so of course out of all this the complying presentation is one only the answer is a next question in accordance with ucp 600 which of the following alterations can a first beneficiary request 
a transferring bank to make under a transferable documentary credit. So here they are asking what change can a first beneficiary request the transferring bank to do under a transferable letter of credit. Now here they are saying extending the expiry date which means you are increasing the expiry date. Can you do that as per UCP 600? Sorry, no, you can't extend it, but you can of course reduce it. Decrease the unit price. Yes, of course that is possible because you now you are transferring it to another beneficiary who can actually produce the good for a very low cost and send it to you. You will add on the margin and sell. So yes, you can decrease the unit price. Decrease the insurance cover, sorry, out of all the items that you change, it is the insurance cover that will increase, it won't decrease. So no, that's not the correct one there. Final answer option, extend the period for shipment, sorry, that's also not possible. You can reduce it, but no, you can't extend it. So here the correct answer is answer B. A transferable credit can do which of the following? Protect the applicant from risk of loss and error. So the one who's applying for the documentary credit is free from risk of loss and error. Sorry, that's not available under transferable credit. Allow the second beneficiary to obtain payment for complying documents. Yes, in a transferable credit, that option or that opportunity is available. Third answer option, restrict the right of the second beneficiary to claim payment directly from the nominated bank. Sorry, that restriction is not done through transferable credit. So no, that's not the correct one. Permit the supplier to provide the intermediary trader with the security of a documentary credit. Sorry, that option is also not provided through transferable credit. So here the correct answer is answer B. Question number 13. A documentary credit calls for a draft at 91 days bill of lading date drawn on the confirming bank. The documentary credit is available by is it available by refinance? Is it available by acceptance? Is it available by site payment or deferred payment? So here if you see in the question, the key word is, it calls for a draft at 95 days bill of lading. So it's not definitely site payment. There is no documentary credit available on refinance, sorry. If it's on deferred payment, there should be an undertaking involved. But here what is involved is draft. So here the correct answer is answer B, which is acceptance. Question number 14. A documentary credit pre-advice is issued on 1st March for US dollar 510,000 with the following terms and conditions. Partial shipments are allowed, latest shipment date 30th April, expiry date 15th May. On 2nd March, the applicant request an amendment prohibiting part shipment and extending the expiry date to 30th May. Now, here in this question they tell you 
the pre advice is already issued on 1st of march it is on the second that the applicant is presenting these amendments in accordance with ucp 600 what must the issuing bank do four answer options are given clarify with the applicant the period for presentation issue the documentary credit as originally instructed issue the documentary credit incorporating all the amendments issue the documentary credit incorporating only the extended expiry date so of course here when you bring in an amendment all three needs to agree on it so what must the issuing bank do the issuing bank should ideally issue the documentary credit as originally instructed because the pre-advice was issued on that so here the correct answer is answer b final question that we will be discussing question number 15 on 3rd january an irrevocable documentary credit for dollars five hundred thousand is confirmed on 17th january the confirming bank receives an amendment cancelling the documentary credit it advises to the beneficiary as at 18th january what is the liability of both issuing bank and the confirming bank so the confirming bank has confirmed on 3rd january they receive an amendment from the issuing bank on the 17th january now ucp 600 says issuing bank is bound by the amendment by the time it issues it confirming bank is bound by the amendment by the time it confirms it but what about their liability now here you are cancelling the lc in full can they say look here moment i issued it i am bound by the amendment so i get to cancel it can the confirming bank say the same i am bound by the amendment moment i confirm it so i should be entitled to cancel no you should remember a letter of credit amendment both needs to be in compliance and accepted by three main parties involved issuing bank confirming bank and the beneficiary so here until the beneficiary accepts the amendment the liability of both the banks will continue as it is so here first option issuing and confirming bank no liability sorry that's not the option here correct answer here issuing and confirming bank both have the liability of 500000 yes they both have still issuing bank zero dollars confirming bank 500 dollars no both the banks have the same liability so far Issuing bank $500 and confirming bank $0. Again, that is not the correct answer. So question number 15, the correct answer is B. Until the amendment is accepted, both issuing and confirming bank will have a liability of $500,000. So I hope this discussion of the 15 MCQs was helpful to you. We'll meet again in another video discussing similar types of MCQs. If you are interested, please let me know whether I need to continue such videos in the future as well. Okay, thank you so much for listening in. We'll meet again in another video. I hope this video was helpful to you. Thank you for listening and subscribe and support us for more videos.